Hey, do I know you? You look kind of familiar. I'm Patrice. I'm the host of Bayes for Alien podcast, allegedly. So I'm recording this tangent episode because today, the day that I've released it, is the 11th of November. And that's a pretty special day for us in Australia and generally around the Commonwealth as it is a day that we celebrate, well, maybe not celebrate, but observe to honour members of the armed forces who died in the line of duty. So if you're a bit of a history buff, you may recall that the hostilities formally ended on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918. The signing of the Treaty of Versailles on the 28th of June 1919 is the day that officially ended World War I. So I understand that in America, the 11th of November is recognised as Veterans Day. So originally it was known as Armistice Day, but it was given a new name in 1954 at the end of the Korean War to honour all veterans. So I thought because of this date and the fact that this is the first time that I've had a chance to sit down behind my desk for a very long while, I thought it would be good to get back into the swing of things by covering something which heralds from... 1915 and an event which allegedly happened in the trenches in World War One. World War One is such a bleak moment in human history and it was just in general I think fair to say that it was a boggy horror. The invention I guess of chemical warfare, machine guns, trenches, just the whole the whole lot would have been absolutely atrocious and so It's not too far removed to think that with death everywhere, spirituality and religion would never have been too far away from a soldier's mind. The world of the supernatural would creep into their everyday lives just because of the fact that the emotional stress that they are under and the death that they saw all around them would have probably lent on some kind of form of spirituality or religion to make sense of it all you know, or to create a sense of hope or faith. I feel like one of the most well-known stories associated with World War I is the Angels of Mon. So on August the 23rd, 1914, less than one month after the beginning of World War I, the British Expeditionary Force was in action across the Channel, finding itself in kind of huge trouble. The German invaders had quickly swept through most of Belgium and were making their way quickly to France. So stuck bang in the middle of the invading German forces and France were 4,000 Commonwealth troops in the muddy fields of Mon. They were outnumbered five to one. And you know, I'm not a gambling person, but I feel like that's, that's not great odds. So the stark reality which faced the 8th Brigade at this point was to their left, 21,000 Germans were occupying the city and threatening the British rear. To the right, they had the 7th Bremen Regiment, which was holding down Spien. So it was starting to look like the Germans would very easily be able to encircle and annihilate the British troops. However, this wasn't the case and they were able to successfully retreat. So the legend goes, that the men in the trenches began to pray and that their prayers were answered in the form of a ghostly presence descending down between the English forces and the German forces. As the Germans closed in on this strange cloud that had appeared from nowhere, their horses reared up and the German soldiers were faced with an army of angels. So on September the 29th, 1914, a fantasy author called Arthur Matchen published a short story called The Bowman in a London newspaper. And in this story, he spoke of this divine intervention happening on the battlefield, except he let his imagination run wild. And he basically turned around and said that angels that appeared on the Battle of Mons were actually phantom archers from the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. The Battle of Agincourt is a famous English victory, which is, you know, primarily because of the effective use of the longbowmen and archers by the English when they were outnumbered by the French. 
something that kind of has always piqued my interest about this story, you know, the, the role of the archers. And it wasn't until I did more further research into the Battle of Agincourt that it actually made me wonder, like, was it the French archers that did a really fucking shit job? in the Battle of Agincourt, come to kind of defend their homeland of France against the invading Germans and help the British almost in a way of like making amends for the 1415 battle? Or was it English archers helping their fellow countrymen? So Arthur Mention published the story in September of 1914 And in April 1915, Spiritualist magazine basically ran a story on the visions and also, you know, similar accounts that had happened in World War I. And as you would know from kind of other shows that I've done or even just like the little shorts that I did uh, last month, that this time is kind of like spiritualist city central movement time so we're in the you know just just coming off the bat of the victorian era where the spiritualist movement was kind of introduced i guess to english society and you know now in 1915 we are in another period of time where it's having another kind of burst of popularity because of the atrocities of war and because of the death that people were experiencing. So knowing what we do know about this time in history and the fact that the spiritualist movement really did take people out of kind of conventional religion. The church is obviously going to take this kind of stories of angels and run with it. And that's kind of exactly what they did because by May 1915, sermons all across the British Empire were using these stories of angels, especially the angels of the Battle of Mons, as proof of action of divine providence on the side of the Allies in this war. It had absolutely reached a fever pitch and the story was being run in newspapers all across the world. So Arthur Matchin was a little bit like, oh fuck, like holy shit, this has gotten really out of hand everyone thinks that this is a real story and the truth is is that he pretty much kind of made it up especially the whole like archer story and so he tried to set the record straight and everyone was just like completely incensed that he was trying to take the shine off this incredibly you know patriotic important story for morale So following the reports of the Angels of Mon, there tended to be like lots of other kind of stories of apparitions happening in World War I, including apparitions of Joan of Arc. So interestingly though, despite the fact that Arthur Matchin just entirely agreed that he had made up the whole thing, there were actually soldiers who had fought in the Battles of Mon that said that there actually truly was some kind of strange presence among them that day. So apparently in 1915, an officer that had been at the Battle of Mons said that they didn't see like archers or anything like that, but that there was a particularly strange cloud that interposed between the Germans and the British, which effectively allowed them to escape. So the cloud didn't attack anybody it was more benevolent okay so that's where we're at a strange cloud comes out of nowhere and helps people to escape okay all right i can get on board with that because and this is where it gets personal for me so a little bit of history about me is that i come from a very long line of mariners people who are very comfortable at sea so my gramps my great grandfather was a cape horner and he was in the merchant navy in world war ii and his brother uncle arch was see this is where i always get mixed up because i'm pretty sure that he may have just been in the navy not the merchant navy but anyway it's his story that makes me believe that maybe maybe there was something that happened on the battlefield of mons 
just because of this story that I know happened to my great uncle. So growing up, I kind of I kind of was raised with this knowledge that my uncle had been in a 2000 mile lifeboat drifting journey in World War II, which is not until you become an adult <laughs> that you realize like how fucking terrifying and horrific that is and how scary that must have been. And yeah, it's not until you grow up that you realize, wow, that's an incredible story. And I'm pretty sure actually that it was, he was in the Guinness book of records there for a while for like the third longest lifeboat journey or something like that. I've got a link here for an article that was written in November 1948. If you're interested in reading about the journey that my great uncle endured. So basically what happened was my uncle was on this ship, which was a civilian ship. I think it may have even been a Red Cross ship from what I remember. So it had women and children on it and it was traveling to Madagascar from some archipelago around that area. So the ship Nalor around midnight on the 29th of June 1944 was struck by a torpedo from an enemy submarine um, and it was assumed to be Japanese. Luckily they had enough time to lower some boats into the water and evacuate like some survivors. In the back of their mind they knew that there was obviously a submarine in the vicinity somewhere and they were expecting it to surface which it eventually did and in fact there were two submarines that surfaced and they shot at this stationary ship which was kind of like the final death blow the ship began to burn and you know obviously there were survivors off but the Nalor was no more it was basically going to sink so in this lifeboat that my uncle was in, the engineer who happened to be the senior officer on that lifeboat, because that's kind of what happens, like if there's a survival circumstance like that, obviously the most highest ranking officer then becomes kind of like the raft boat commander, I guess. He had said, okay, well, the ship's gone. Let's like turn around. They moved around only to be faced with another set of lights. And they soon realized that it was a submarine. So the crew on this lifeboat were hearing no don'ts and cries for help from the direction of the other submarine. Remember, it's like two o'clock in the morning at this point, And so it was dark except for these lights. They said that they basically could see the wash from the submarine. They could smell the oil from the submarine. And they just thought that they were goners. So they've all kind of crouched down in this lifeboat. And then at that moment almost inexplicably a random ocean squall which is basically like you know a, a, a sea a sea storm i guess just blotted them out from this submarine that was coming to kill the survivors and yeah it just blocked them out basically in this curtain of rain and then when the squall had cleared they were alone on a calm sea i even get shivers thinking about that because it's such an inexplicable event and it happened to my uncle you know so I know that it's true I know that that's a story that's been like it's been told in this story in the link that I'm going to provide in the description box um, the daily log that was taken by one of the Australian seamen is actually like held in the Australian um, war history museum and that's what happened like this random sheet of rain came up and saved my uncle and 43 other people on this lifeboat just out of nowhere and you know to me that's a miraculous event you know it almost goes beyond a coincidence and the parallels that I find from the Battle of Mon with this strange fog which kind of helped the British to escape and this strange sea fog sea storm that helped my uncle to escape maybe there is something to these benevolent forces in times of war that that help people escape with their lives which you know just stop bloodshed they don't actually inflict any kind of bloodshed onto anybody else 
So I'm really interested to see what you think about this. And, you know, particularly if you're listening to this and you have ever been in the armed forces or in some kind of survival circumstance where you felt like you were faced with certain death and then something inexplicable had happened that had saved your life, especially if it appeared to be some kind of weather event like what happened to my uncle or potentially what happened at the Battle of Mon. Because I just find that really curious and I'm really interested to find out if anybody have had, has had any kind of similar circumstances or if, if you have stories in your family from World War I or World War II that kind of mirror that sentiment. I'd be really interested um, to hear about that. You can contact me on my social media pages if you like. I've got an Instagram page called A is for Alien. You can find me on that handle or you can send me an email to a is for alien podcast at gmail.com, which um, I do my best to respond to every single email that you guys send me because I really love hearing from you and reading your stories. Alrighty, so that's going to be about it from me today, guys. And on this Remembrance Day, you know, however you feel about modern warfare, however you feel about the political implications and the reasons that we engage in wars. I feel like one thing which we can all agree on is that every member of the armed services who enlists has a family and people who love them, whether they have children, wives, parents, brothers and sisters, you know, on today, Remembrance Day and Veterans Day in America. You know, just take a moment to say thank you to the returned servicemen uh, for their service and protecting the liberties and freedoms that we all enjoy today and also to remember those who didn't return from active duty and who made the ultimate sacrifice and I know that for service people who have returned without their colleagues these days can be particularly tough so my thoughts are with you today. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. I'll be catching you really soon. I'm really excited. I don't know if you follow me on Instagram. I've been talking about this new series that I've been working on and writing. And yeah, I'm really excited for that because I've got a little bit more of an AV setup. So I'm going to be branching out into a little bit more kind of like YouTube-y stuff. Uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. I'm really looking forward to my summer and I'm really looking forward to be able to present a package to you that I'm going to be really proud of just in time for your winter. All right, guys. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. I'll catch you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.